thank you for coming out. It is a beautiful day out, so we're very happy about that. And we are in a very beautiful space as well. So thank you to the ICA, and thank you to all of you for coming today. Yes. So my name is Vicki George. I am the Audience Lab Director at Arts Boston. I am also the founder of the Network for Arts and Ministries of Color, which is also a program of Arts Boston. And we are here today to have a really great conversation with some fantastic people who work in the arts and who are allies of the arts. So the Path Forward conversation with Leagues of Color really focuses on leaders who are currently working in different sectors who have made some real great inroads in their career and who are here to talk and to share some of those insights. The Path Forward is the third conversation that we've had so far, following Paving the Way in December of 2017, as well as Amplifying Voices in February of 2018. So initially, I wanted to have these conversations to really hear from leaders of color in the arts who are doing fantastic work because a lot of the times we don't get that opportunity to hear their voices. And so today's conversation will take part of that idea and move it into other sectors, um, work that is being done in other sectors, and the ways that we can all work together to really challenge our city of Boston, to really challenge our city to be better, to be more inclusive, and to really uplift and recognize the talented people of color who work and live in this city. So, before I move on, I do want to say a couple of thank yous. I do first and foremost want to thank Bank of America because without their support, um, this network wouldn't be as robust and we wouldn't be um, able to do as many of these activities. So we're very, very thankful for them. Um, and then I also want to thank Kelly Gifford. Where's Kelly? There she is. Um, so Kelly is, is the Deputy Director of Public Engagement and Planning at the ICA. And uh, pretty much about a year and a half ago when you know, we had a meeting, just a random little meeting together, she really said she wanted to make sure that the ICA could be in support of the network as much as we would allow. Um, and we had a lovely reception here last August outside with some really great music. And we're so happy to be back here again. So thank you, Kelly, for all of your hard work and for being a great ally and a supporter of both Arts Boston and the network. I'd like to invite Kelly to say a few words. Hi, thank you so much um, for joining us here this evening. I would like to thank Vicki and Arts Boston and the Network for Arts Administrators of Color for choosing the ICA um, to host this uh, discussion. It's an important discussion and I'm thrilled that the panelists are here to share their expertise and their experiences with us. Um, over the past decade, the ICA has become nationally recognized for our teen arts education program. And working with the Walton Family Foundation and the Ford Foundation, <coughs> we recently received a grant to extend this platform to include a teen leadership program, paid museum internships, and postgraduate curatorial fellowships. Our goal is really to open up the field to a range of students and try to develop the arts leaders for the future. These initiatives are led by Marnica Garza, our Director of Education, who is here this evening. Um, I'm sure you've all read the national study from the Mellon Foundation that only 16% of art museum leadership positions are held by people of color. Um, we do the work that we do, and we're very passionate about it, but we know it's not enough. Um, we really are actively trying to change this, that statistic here at the museum but it is difficult and we really appreciate discussions like this and what we can learn from the panelists tonight to help us achieve this much needed goal. So I just wanted to say thank you again and thanks a lot for choosing the uh, ICA for the panel discussion. So uh, this is exciting, we are going to get started and I would like to introduce to you our moderator for the evening. So Myron Parker Brass is the executive director for the arts um, at the Boston Public Schools. She is a native of Chicago, Illinois. Myron is <laughs> also a professional musician and music director working to provide access to quality arts education for students, 
teachers, families, and the broader community. Myron joined the Boston Public Schools in June of 2011, providing strategic vision and planning and building capacity to expand arts education within the BPS with a focus on access, equity, and quality arts education for all students. So thank you and welcome Myron. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here to have a conversation with um, my colleagues here. And as Vicki said, um, this, this evening we want to have a, co a conversation in that cross-sector space. So while we're going to be talking about the arts and how we build a space for sh a leadership in, in the arts, we want to do it from not the arts space, but from the cross-sector space. So we're going to talk to we're going to talk about how other sectors can be that advocate, that change, uh, can be that support for the arts community as we begin to look at or look further into how we really move this notion of leadership in our arts institutions, in our art spaces um, that reflect the communities that they serve. And so I'm excited to, uh, to be having this conversation. Um, I'm going to introduce my, my colleagues here. And this really is a dialogue. Um, if I'm looking at my watch, it's because we don't have a lot of time. It's not that I'm not interested. Um, we don't have a lot of time and we want to get to as much of the conversation as possible and also allow you the opportunity to share your thoughts and to, and to ask questions. And so I'm delighted to introduce Yasmin Cruz. Um, Yasmin is in client services and strategic planning at the Brown Advisory. Um, in that role, she provides comprehensive strategic support to private clients to the private client service practice. Prior to um, moving to Brown Advisory, Yasmin was with the John Hancock Financial Services as Director of Corporate Responsibility. Yasmin is also a member of the Arts Boston Board of Directors, and we'd like to congratulate Yasmin on two things. Uh, this past weekend, uh, she graduated with her MBA from the Carroll School of Management. Yes. And even more exciting, <coughs> she got engaged. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to have Yasmin with us. And then uh, my, my other colleague, Justin Kang. Justin is the Vice President for Economic Growth at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce and also the Executive Director of City Awake, a program of the Chamber that works to empower the next generation of Greater Boston leaders. And so Justin is preparing for a, um, a forum this fall, and I think everybody should write this down. It's called uh, Justin and the City Awake. They will be hosting a forum entitled Fierce Urgency of Now, Energizing Millennials of Color to Unlock Boston's Promise. That's a lot, but write it down. <laughs> taking place September 20th through the 24th. And so we have everyone's name and email address. We anticipate that you will be attending you September 20th through the 24th. No, thank you, Great Justin. promoter, Welcome. thank you. <laughs> so we do have some questions that we want to begin with, and certainly um, we'll try to keep to our time, but we also want to make sure that we're having a good conversation about um, the role of the arts in building this space for leadership, leadership of color, but also how the, the cross sector of Boston can support that. So why don't we just start with each of you telling us a little bit about the work that you do and currently how that intersects with Boston's arts and cultural community. Sure, I'll start. It's awkward to talk about yourself, but just to give you some context in terms of how I come to this space and, and view it, I actually became engaged with the art sector through working with the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, where I wore a few hats. I, I wore a docent hat, so while I'm not creative, I had a lot of opinions about <laughs> art <laughs> and could walk you through the collection um, and solicit your opinions. And then I was, from 2010 up until now, I remain engaged with their a committee for cultural engagement, which was an audience development committee. And now I'm gonna serve on their selection committee for um, choosing their chief learning officer and head of community engagement. Um, while there, I also wore the hat of a funder in my last 
role in former life, I was in um, a grant making role and that's where I helped you know, build a portfolio that funded organizations like ZoomIt, like mm -hmm. Artists for Humanity, like um, Boston Dance Alliance, uh, like the ICA <laughs> <laughs> and the MFA. And now my role is more um, as a director and outside kind of uh, lending to strategy on Arts Boston board. And then I'm also on the Lindy Zakum Fund Board where I am the chair of grants allocation and there we fund small organizations like Ballet Rocks. Mm -hmm. So my view is a few different perspectives. Yeah. Justin. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I just wanna say, uh, um, also wanna say congratulations to Yasmin who's a great friend and she had a great weekend. So congratulations. <laughs> So my name is Justin Kang, I'm the Vice President of Economic Growth at the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce. I always, when sort of like an audience that isn't your typical Chamber of Com uh, sort of audience, uh, are people familiar with the Chamber of Commerce? If so, raise your hand. Okay, good. I once did like a 100 person panel of college students, like no one raised their hand, so it was like very telling. Uh, so if you're not familiar though, Chambers of Commerce are not uh, government agencies, they are a business group representing sort of the, the business community. We represent 1,400 members. Uh, in the greater Boston region, and I get to lead our economic development initiatives. Uh, and in this conversation, um, arts and culture is completely vital uh, to the work that we do, especially around talent, attraction, and retention. Uh, so I'm lucky enough to also serve on the Mass Creative Board, uh, as well as a spoken word uh, youth collective called Mass Leap. Um, and every day, uh, it gets more confirmed that for the city to keep its young talent, even if you hate millennials, um, and you can raise your hand if you do. Uh, 50 percent. Oh, that guy did. Okay. Uh, uh, Fifty percent of the workforce already are in their 20s and 30s, right? And that's only going to grow and grow. So, from an employer perspective, we do want young talent to stay here. But since 2015, uh, millennials are leaving, and that's because other cities are doing a great job in providing good jobs, right? Um, and for when you ask someone where they live or think about moving, you say like, What's, how's Chicago or how's Boston, et cetera. They never say, oh, they have great jobs there, right? What they talk about is the food, they talk about the arts, they talk about the culture, the nightlife, et cetera. And for us, we need to do a better job there from Boston's perspective. I think we have a lot of fun things to do that, but we need to create that emotional connection uh, more so from a city person perspective. And then the second thing I think a lot about in the arts is that you know, housing affordability is very expensive here. But you look at New York and SF, which are equally as expensive, but people are moving there uh, in droves. And when you think about that, it's not because they wanna pay more in housing rent, but New York and SF at least espouse this like, you know, utopian vision of arts and culture, right? And they will make that, they will pay that luxury to live in those cities, yeah. Yeah, um, more so than so in Boston. So, uh, in my role in the last year, these are the findings, and that's why as a chamber that traditionally doesn't engage in arts and culture, we think it's absolutely critical from an economic development perspective. Yeah, yeah and I guess the other thing that I wanted to piggyback on in terms of understanding you know, Boston when you think about some of these other cities is you know, art as a destination, and how often do you experience people who say they're coming to Boston not you know, just to visit the city and to walk around and to, you know, go to an event, but specifically for art. Mm -hmm. So Justin, let's just go back to um, your comment about um, part of the work of the chamber is to um, recruit and retain talent. Mm -hmm. um, and that you should be engaged with the arts and sector, um, the arts and culture sector. So. How, sh how should we engage with you? How can we make that happen? What are the steps that we as the arts community can begin that process? You know, I think it's less about the arts and culture community and not to put the onus on the business community, but I think I and my colleagues need to do a better job in communicating the value. Mm -hmm. And being on the board of Mass Creative, the work at Arts Boston and others, um, I think there's a willingness on the arts and, you know, the arts and culture side. Um, and I think, you know, similarly, it's on our job to make that case. So even recently, we had our CEO, Jim Rooney, speak at an event where Mass Creative released a report, so that's one signal, right? Uh, but ultimately, uh, we just need to, and I'll tell you a story where, you know, it was a few years ago where housing wasn't a policy priority for the business community. We ranked our membership, and it was like sixth or seventh or eighth. Um, 
but they would always rank like talent number two or one. Uh, but I think you can easily connect how housing and talent are interchangeable, uh, but the business case wasn't there. Housing was always seen as like affordable housing or luxury housing, but not anything in the middle. Uh, so I think it's only a matter of time with the right partnerships that we make creativity, arts, culture, as much as uh, a talent acquisition play and retention play as anything else. So I think um, we have the right leadership and it's just a matter of time. So Yasmin, you talked about kind of your diverse um, enterings into the arts and cultural world through uh, many angles. Um, and we have a pretty diverse group of audience members. So there's representation of um, different disciplines, different genres, large and small, uh, some um, other sectors in the, in, the, in the audience with us. But as you have kind of traveled through the, the arts community, um, if I were to ask you your perception of Boston's arts and cultural scene, what would you say? I would say that we certainly are a hub <coughs> given the volume of organizations, art serving organizations that we have in this city. However, <laughs> I would say that it can feel very fragmented by neighborhood. I would say that as an outsider, if you crave, well lately there have been more late night activations and opportunities, <laughs> but you know, transportation is an issue. So even if there are late night options, you continue to have transportation challenges and obstacles, I think given kind of, you know, the Uber Lyft reality we're in, some of that is minimized now. Um, but I, I would definitely say, you know, we're a hub, we're not really late night, and there's a, a desire to engage, and we have the, the talent, um, but there's some pieces that don't all the way connect. Mm -hmm. Justin, thoughts? Um, I agree a lot on that, and I think, I think there's just, Boston personally has a great arts and culture scene. I think it's just, um, it, from a public perception, might be about equity. It's about sort of large institutions versus you know uh, more community-based arts, and um, I think it's a lost opportunity. But at least we have the assets and the resources that um, that we can fix that problem. And we should pay people. So I think earlier we heard a statistic about the low percentage of leaders inside museums that are people of color. We know that that is prevalent in, in a lot of our um, arts and cultural institutions. And so we consider that a big challenge for the sector, um, particularly in a city where we are becoming majority minority or already are majority minority. Um, there is a serious lack of people of color represented. And so how do we shake up this current leadership structure? How do, what, what do we do to begin to move this? This is where you can be disruptive. <laughs> uh, you know, for, for, you know, I think about this a lot. Um, ultimately, we need to uh, empower sort of young professionals of color and give them hope. And, you know, uh, one of the things that we're focused on, there's two reasons I think why people are leaving Boston. One is housing, or there's many reasons, but two that are top of mind for me. One is housing, and two is the experience of millennials of color in greater Boston. We did a report of, uh, with the Boston Foundation last year, and that was sort of the takeaway. It, it, doesn't, it shouldn't surprise anyone that a person of color, regardless of age, has a different experience in Boston, but we need to think it from a generational perspective now and say it explicitly, um, that building communities here as a person of color versus DC, Atlanta, Montreal, Toronto, basically any other city is very different. Uh, so earlier I mentioned that 50% uh, of the workforce are millennials, 43% of millennials in Boston are uh, young professionals of color. Uh, so again, if you hate millennials and if you don't like other races, it doesn't matter because you, you need to make Boston more inclusive to this demographic and say it explicitly. Um, so I think just acknowledging that. Um, I had someone who moved here a few months ago, a young woman of color, got a great job at IBM, and she was like, where are all the people of color? Um, and that's, there's, it's bad for two reasons. One, if, like, if there weren't people of color in Boston, that's one embarrassment, right? Uh, but there are people of color in Boston being a majority minority city, and the fact that she has that experience uh, is another type of embarrassment. Um, so I think just the acknowledgement um, and getting other sectors involved. Um, and I think there's, uh, and Jasmine, we, could, you know, we talk about this a lot, is sort of the intergenerational 
uh, sort of cooperation because of young professionals of color and older leaders of color, um, and not trying to make it combative, um, and just creating more mentoring, better mentoring relationships and. Uh, there's good examples, bad examples. I'm, sh I'm sure we'll dive deeper into that. But yeah, I to get and that's there. where I was going to go. I, so I agree with you. I would say we definitely have a representation issue. I notice this because when I travel to other cities and I see people of color around after I leave the airport, I'm like, oh my gosh. And I usually chat the person next to me and say, do you see how many people of color? And that's when I realize I'm from Boston because <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't be um, a normal thing for anyone. Um, but I will say that I think things are shifting here. I remember when if you wanted to engage with <coughs> DEI um, mentors or sponsorship program, there was pretty much one or two options. I mean, and it was owned by, you know, kind of one, one leader. Mm -hmm. And now there are more opportunities to engage with mentors and to have conversations about sponsorship. And it's not kind of owned by one person. Also, I would say previously in my, you know, you tell me your perception if I'm off, but you know, when you have a generation that occupies these roles for the first time, I think a lot of the experience is how do I maintain this leadership position? And it, I don't think the conversation was about how do I bring people along? And I'm seeing now that shift to not how do I occupy this space and be, you know, the one person in it, but you know, what does my legacy look like? How am I engaging the next generation? So I'm optimistic. Yeah, and I'll just a uh, personal anecdote there is that um, I took a, ch you know, a uh, couple years ago I started an organization called City Awake, and then it was acquired by the chamber two years ago. And uh, for those who know me. Uh, I would never join a chamber. It's not my life's dream to work at a chamber of commerce. Um, <laughs> transparently, it was a hip hop mogul and art thief. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, for, uh, sorry, art thief, take back. Sorry, Thomas Crown Affair, <laughs> great movie. Um, but you know, the chamber's led by a man named Jim Rooney, 60 plus years old. Sorry, she gives away his age. He's an older gentleman, uh, Irish, Dorchester bred, etc. I don't know you as well. It was like name. Twitter. Someone's going to tweet that and like at tag him. He's going to be like. Um, and we met, and I give him a lot of credit because in so many ways, we could have not worked well together. I, in so many ways, when the first conversation started between me and Jim about joining forces, I could have been like, no, absolutely not. I would never want to work for the chamber. And he, from externally, cosmetically, just seemed like an old Irish guy, right? Um, but something immediately came to clear, like in our first conversations, like we both love this region more than anything. He's dedicated his career there, and he's like, I don't care about credit. I just want to make this place better, and he gave me all the autonomy in the world. Um, and you know, that's an example where I give him a lot of credit. Where he, you know, there's a lot of CEOs that won't let other people be on the organization on panels or speak a lot, or even like I know some that you have to get CEO permission to even join like a host committee, right? Um, and for Jim and the chamber to to push me out there and vice versa, um, you know, uh, I really appreciate that. I think that's an example of, of possibility. Yeah. So let's talk a bit more about the, the role of um, building succession. You know, um, you mentioned that um, there are those of us like myself who've been sitting in these roles for lots of years. Um, and we came to these roles as sometimes novices, but we came as the only one of inside institutions. So we spent a lot of our time putting that stake in the ground and letting people understand that we could do this work well, that we knew how to do this work. And so I don't think we thought about, and who am I building behind me? Who am I bringing along behind me? So let's talk about how we can begin to get leaders to understand how to build that succession plan, how to begin to reach out and be that mentor. This is, I think there's no one way to approach how this works. I love that this is a sector approach. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have someone advocating for you who has relevance and access to a seat at the table. But I always 
have kind of this saying in my own life that I've employed is why well, have a mentor when you can have a board of advisors. And mm -hmm. so I always make sure I have someone who's relevant to the sector who can push me, but then always engage others who might have an opposing view or maybe a different gender or maybe of a different, um, you know, generation where, you know, the dynamics were different. So it's important to have, I think, multiple viewpoints. A lot of stock right now is being put into that mentor and that sponsor. It's mm -hmm. important to have that. I don't think you can move forward without it. Mm -hmm. But you also need to, I think, have a broad uh, array of perspectives guiding you. Justin. Nothing else to add. I, mean, I, I have nothing to add there. I think it's just that's pretty, <laughs> yeah, pretty right. Okay, so um, you both are um, participants in the arts. You both um, tr are truly j drawn to the arts on, on whatever levels, Mr. Hip Hop Mogul here. <laughs> um, um, so talk about your experiences in the arts here and what's the most memorable experience that you've had in Boston and why? Um, gosh, you know, and I, I'm not artistic at all. I'm, for whatever reason, I just always been compelled by it since watching, you know, Diddy on MTV. That's when I wanted to be a hip hop mogul. You're in a crafts yeah. class. Yeah. Right I know. Now. No, that, I'm trying to guess, but, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, oh, gosh, you know, this past year I've been going to a new creative activity every month um, to put myself out of the comfort zone. And it just sort of reminds me every month, uh, and I dread going to it because I'm like, oh, I'm gonna be so bad, et cetera. It's a Saturday or Sunday. I want to just like relax and watch Netflix and. Uh, I go and like every month I took a photography class at Boston Photography Workshop. It was amazing. Next month I sewed and knitted or something. I made a tote bag <laughs> at Gather Here. I did glass blowing, blowing at Diablo Glass School. I just made a ring making class um, at uh, Artisans Asylum. I did a uh, writing class uh, from the immigrant perspective with Grub Street. Um, next week, next month I'm doing a painting class and. I know that was multiple moments, so I That's apologize. Okay. No, no. Uh, but I will just say the one that I loved, all of them were so insightful and uh, personally, you know, insightful to, for me to go through. I love the one that grew up straight, though. Um, I went in there not thinking I was going to share what I wrote, um, and I did. And it was because it was just me and a bunch of older uh, Latina women who are just so giving, and they were just complimenting me left and right. Um, and it was awesome. So. <laughs> Um, and they just made me feel so welcomed, and I'm like very, I, you know. Uh, Did they give you a nickname? I don't know. They were, they were just, you know, they were just great. <laughs> um, and I, I shared what I wrote because of their encouragement, and I, I would never have done that. And uh, for Grub Street to provide me that opportunity is, is pretty memorable. Wow. So my most memorable arts experience happened when I was in high school, and I think that's why it was so important to me and continues to be important to me to connect young people to arts. I think young people have to work to access the arts, even if it is a graduation requirement, but Myron, <laughs> you're working on that, and I know the ICA <laughs> is working on that as well. Um, but I remember the John Biggers exhibit at the MFA mm. and just being blown away that there was a story about African Americans on walls that I didn't expect them to be there. And that will always um, remain in my mind. And then another is in the South End, I was brought um, by my parents to see a documentary about Asada Shakur. Mm -hmm. um, and this was I don't know, in the late 90s. And this was in the Sola District before I think it was as cool as it is now. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember being able to be out late with my parents and having seen that movie and trying to digest it. So those are two of kind of moments where you know, art shifted my perspective and how I saw the world, how I saw my culture and experience, you know, identity. Okay. So we certainly have more questions, but um, also being um, aware of time, we wanted to give you an opportunity to either ask um, 
questions of Yasmin or, and, and or Justin or to provide some insights from the work that you are doing um, or just to start a dialogue amongst everyone that is here. We do have a mic, so um, we do ask that you come down front to ask the question because it is being live streamed. And so rather than me try to repeat your question and not get it correct, we're gonna ask you to come down um, and ask your question or give your insight or uh, whatever moves you at this moment. Sarah. Good evening. So thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity in this conversation. Uh, my name is Sarah Tang. I have a comment and a question. I'd like to actually share a, a really wonderful, powerful quote by Aristotle who said, educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. So I think where we have to begin to elevate the arts is in education. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very sad and disappointing to hear that there are actually some public elementary schools that have no <coughs> music at all, none. So I would like to present a question and also share with you how we can use the arts to not only be elevated, but to also address this critical issue we call diversity and lack of diversity, because I think the arts can play a powerful role to help address issues of lack of inclusion. And I'd like to share with everybody a poem that actually received a resolution by the Boston City Council recognizing it as a powerful tool to reduce prejudice. It's called The Sun. It says, are you greater than the sun that shines on everyone? Black, brown, yellow, red, and white, the sun does not discriminate. So this poem actually inspired a song and a program called Singing Equality Across America and Around the World. And the song was performed at the United Nations by children. If you go to our website, worldunitinc.org, you will see a video of 429 children singing the song, and they're even doing it in sign language. And we will be producing another video of 800 children singing the song and even doing the verse in sign language. The song was uh, written by John Ciambriello, and this, the title of the song is We All See the Stars. So I want to share that with the, this wonderful audience the thought of the arts helping us address these critical social issues. And I wanted to present it to the panel, your thoughts about how the arts can not only play a role in the economy and bringing people, but how we can play a critical role to addressing these critical social issues and how do you help the business community recognize that? Thank you. I, I'll start because we were, we were talking a little bit about before, and uh, this is my own personal opinion out of the chamber, but we need to invest a lot more in arts education, arts funding, and all that stuff. That's my own personal opinion. Um, and why, though, is uh, part of my job is also thinking about new technologies, new economies, and um, creativity is the, is the thing that will distinguish us between humans and robots, point blank. Uh, I've been learning a lot about AI, robotics, automation, et cetera. And, um, uh, we definitely value technical engineering STEM skills, and we should not go away from that. But ultimately, uh, the jobs will be given and provided to those who have creativity uh, 25 years from now. We don't know what those jobs are, um, but it is absolutely fundamental. Uh, and you, you made a good point before we talked, is that we label these sort of skills of arts, et cetera, as soft skills. Uh, and then we create this construct binary of like hard skills versus soft skills, and we gotta pick one or the other. And, uh, that's wrong. Um, so for us as a business community and, and for us to you know, continue to provide, uh, to fill these you know, jobs now and then 25 years from now, is that we need a workforce that has the ability to think conceptually, abstractly, uh, otherwise um, you know, the jobs that require sort of uh, re rinse and repeat sort of uh, behavior uh, won't exist. So uh, I think you make a great point and I fully support it. Yeah. I totally agree with arts being a vehicle for understanding um, each other, yourself. Um, I also think art builds community. Um, art is a way to have a discourse 
in a, in, you know, in a way that could be productive where you know, an absence of art may not facilitate the same uh, discourse. I think we're all in agreement. This is a tough environment in the corporate funding community for arts. There are very few corporate funders who find this in their focus area are dedicated to arts funding. So, you know, making that business case can be challenging, but uh, education certainly is something that is within many organizations' priorities. So I think it's always about finding the right angle and making the case. And Justin provides a great business case for innovation is huge. And, and creativity is a 21st century skill. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're able to you know, convey that in a solid way, you know, maybe we can unlock more funding to arts education. But unfortunately, I don't think we're in an environment where if you say, oh, please come fund my wonderful arts program that, you know, you get, uh, that resonates. I think you definitely have to draw on some downstream impacts of art. And as Jess and I were talking earlier, I think it really is about changing the narrative. And so how do we move that narrative about um, the place for arts, arts education, arts and culture? Um, Justin talked about um, talent um, acquisition and retention. We know that there's um, businesses booming in Boston. You know, lots of development is happening. You know, there are lots of large corporations coming to Boston. And so how do we change that narrative at the table? When they are there, how do we help them understand that in order for this to be a vibrant community for all of those employees that they want to bring to Boston, that they anticipate will move here, the city has to then be that welcoming space. So it has to offer them not only that cultural life, that arts, that arts um, opportunity, but it also has to give them a place to live and be a community. And included in that is the schools. And so inside your schools, they want to make sure that their, their, their children are going to get the best education. And so we need to change that narrative about what that quality education looks like. And that inside there, it includes quality, solid arts education because those skills, those, that creativity, that innovation, you know, that team, being a member of a team, those are not soft skills. Those are hard skills and we teach those skills in and through the arts and you use those skills in so many very different ways. But it is how we move this narrative, how do we change this narrative so that we know when, when Justin is sitting at the table with his business partners, they all understand that language as soon as he starts speaking it. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? Yes. <laughs> okay. We will have to repeat your question simply because we are live streaming it. So I will try my best not to paraphrase, but please.
that is a, a really great uh, question and comment, so thank you for that. And for you all, that is a good question. And if you have examples of ways in which within your current positions of power, how have you been able to kind of look to see who are the next folks coming up behind you or sort of activate and be a sponsor type mentor in that way? I make sure, so I joined the Arts Boston Board last year, I believe. And then quickly after we had governance come up and I recommended um, my Pakistani lawyer friend. So I've already <laughs> brought someone else to the table with me. I, I think, you know, tokenism is a tough thing to be in the only, only, only club and, you know, try to, you know, like you said, if you have a seat at the leadership table, you know, bring someone else along with you. And, you know, that's man-to-man, one-on-one combat. That's not shifting this, you know, in a dramatic way overnight. And that's, that has to be, you know, part of our understanding. You know, the imperative and the urgency and the interest has to be there. Um, but the reality is a lot of this is shifting things one at a time. I mean, I thank you for your comments, and you know, there I think uh, everything you said is spot on. The the stuff here that we're talking about in Boston isn't um, simple at all. It, you know, and I, I'll be transparent. I've been th- I, th- I, w- I think about race a lot in the context of business and community, and uh, sometimes you just get so much hopelessness because you think about how historical and institutional uh, the inequities are from a generational perspective. You know, uh, there are individuals we can help now. Uh, but the gener- it's just generational, from redlining to the war against drugs to everything in between. And now we're talking about decades, centuries uh, of work to get done. And um, you know, in terms of the work that I do, well, I think I always, and that's the framing I always think about it from. Um, in terms of when we talk about racial equity, at least in the business sphere, what does that mean? And re- one of the insights that we've done a lot of research on this is, is just social capital. And I think you, you spoke a lot about it too. It's sort of uh, we talk about financial capital being as inheritable, um, but in terms of like from a young age, uh, what is the best indicator of your future economic success or just success in whatever it is, is who you know, your community, et cetera, um, and their networks and their connections. Because if you even think about it, the internships you got um, are things of equity. Like who do you know, who do you can get connected to, et cetera. Um, so one of the things that we're focused on, at least from that perspective, is internships. We're gonna be focused on a program uh, encouraging the private sector to hire more first-gen students of color to to paid, meaningful internships in the summer. Um, but even that is like a, a band-aid because we'll reach maybe 30, 50, 100 kids, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the other part is um, how do we make a majority minority city not just so segregated in the ways that you're saying if you're walking down the street, et cetera, because you know, I do this every time I go into a bar. I count like I just notice. I, I just support, like, am I the only person of color in this room? I always do that Spotlight instinct. Yeah, yeah, inst- <laughs> instinctively, that's, that's what I do, just like naturally. And I actually said to my friend once, I was like, wow, I'm the only person of color in this bar. 150 person, he was a white guy, and then it's like, uh, whatever. Like, he didn't care, and then we got into a fight, and it's like a weird thing over drinks. But, um, <laughs> um, but one of the strategies, so we're hosting this five-day festival for de- specifically for millennials of color in late September. One, to explicitly get this out there, and we're taking a few strategies, and one is uh, we're getting major institutions to host events catered to millennials of color. So for instance, uh, the Museum of Science is going to be hosting a hip hop concert in their public garden area kind of thing, right? Um, and then we have the Red Sox hosting a millennials of color night against the Orioles, right? So traditional places where you don't see people of color uh, into that spaces. But on the flip side though, it's not just making traditionally white institutions more, uh, you know, we want more welcoming, it's also about elevating the existing work uh, of institutions across traditionally uh, uh, more prominent communities of color and getting people to go to that p- place because you want that foot traffic too. Um, so seeing you know, as parts of Roxbury are getting, becoming cultural districts, designations, et cetera, um, there is great work and it's about uh, elevating it. So anyways, that was rambling because I, just, I think everything you said was right and um, a long road ahead, but um, yeah, that's all I got. And I guess from, from my seat, we are training the next generation. 
And so unlike most urban districts, Boston has been very purposeful about building quality sequential arts education. So our students are learning those skills to either be that artist, to be that arts appreciator, to be that creative, to understand how to take advantage of opportunities because a lot of what you talked about was this opportunity gap. So where is that space that we help them fill that, um, be, be knowledgeable about what's available to them? How do I access that? And so we have had the good fortune to kind of build that space inside BPS. So our young people are leaving our buildings and they are artistically literate. They do understand what a vibrant community should look like when it is full of arts and culture. Um, do we have a lot of work to do? We absolutely do because it, building that space around arts and culture is more than me just training my young people and pushing them out the door, then the community has to be waiting for them. The community has to be you know, helping them understand what is my next role? How do I take this, this, uh, the, all my artistic literacy, this creativity, how do I use that and how do I give it back to my community? Um, but what I hope we are doing in addition to that is helping them understand and celebrate who they are as young artists you know, and, or as young creatives culturally, you know, racially, what that means to them and their community, how do they support that community. Um, and so we, we will continue to do that, but we would love them to use all of that here in Boston. You know, we would love for them to stay here. We would love them to feel like this is a place where I can take all of that and I can still, you know, be, um, be very excited about the place that I live. So, um, hi, my name is Allison Crony Moses. I work at the Elliott School of Fine and Applied Arts. We have a schoolhouse in Jamaica Plain where we serve a lot of people, kids and adults, but we also have a very large outreach program that I'm in charge of, and I work really hard to do programs in schools, um, but also at libraries and other sites. Um, recently, we started an artist in residence program, and my question is really around, as an organization that is doing work in communities um, for quite a while now, and Recently, we had, I think, a lot of energy around this. Um, we want to make sure they're attended. We want to make sure people know about them. We want to make sure that we are inviting local artists in those communities to actually be teachers with us. Um, recommendations for you guys. The question is, do you have recommendations on how do you get the word out about things that are happening? Because I, you talked about how we're separated by neighborhood. Definitely feel it often. Um, so how do you get the word out? Are there other than posting on this great network <laughs> email group, are there ways to promote events or promote um, workshops, opportunities, teaching opportunities, and also to do two things, to make sure that we are making sure that everyone has access to the opportunities that are out there, but also making sure that we are actually recruiting talent from Boston, people of color from Boston that grew up in Boston and not just outsiders that move here that have talent as well, which I love them too, but I'd like to su support Boston people as well. Mm. Jenna. Sure. <laughs> um, my bookmark Arts Boston and the Boston calendar, so just a quick plug there, that's on my bookmark. Good job. That's a true story though, <laughs> I check it every week. Um, I think it's actually interesting, you know, Facebook has these algorithms and recently I noticed like all the events that, I, that like they show to me are like the same events. And I share that story because um, we face that problem where we live in our very siloed communities, right? And we see just the predictability of the same people that you, know, you see at every event. And you get into this trap. So um, it's something that I just recently I struggle with because it's like how do you then expand those networks? And uh, I think ultimately uh, the most successful events that I've ever done is sort of leveraging um, recognizing that I don't have credibility in X community or Y community or whatever, and then finding the right pipeline channel partner to push it out. Um, it takes hard work, it's not easy, it's the, you gotta build that community trust, but uh, just the, the, the events that I've packed to you know, X amount of people have always been done on uh, the support with other organizations uh, that I don't have the connection with, but they do, and for whatever reason, they think the event is aligned in that way. So that's the, yeah, that's the advice I can give there. Yeah. And you'd be the best person to give advice because Justin can absolutely fill a room. Um, and it's such a tough environment. I, I don't really see arts covered in the way that maybe I would like to from a media perspective. I wish that would <laughs> shift. That's one of my frustrations. Um, if there's a podcast of kind of art reviews, you know, please let us know. 
um, just because it's, I feel like you really have to search for that content. Um, I wanted to say that I'm very encouraged by the cross-generational talk that I've experienced in the last maybe two years. I did one of these talks in December, was it? Mm -hmm. And I had about seven people take my card mm -hmm. and say that they were gonna contact me and actually everybody did. Right. Alicia That's right. Chicks was one of those people from the Elliott School. So that, I've been giving out my cards for years and I know that 90% of the people who take my card, I'll never hear from again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to hear from that many people that night, all of whom I've actually sat down with at least once, a couple more than once, um, is encouraging. I think information is everywhere, but I read. Uh, one of the things I will tell people is that you gotta at least glance through the paper paper because there are things in the paper paper that you don't see glancing on your devices. Mm -hmm. um, I go to websites as well as Facebook. I have created databases. I email a lot of people and there are people in here who can say, Candelari has sent me an, an internship, a job, <laughs> an article. So I have on my personal outlook, um, I have list of photographers. I have list of writers. I have list of different people. I have something called info for children. So everybody I know who has a child, I have one for teenagers. And I just, like when I go from this, if I've gotten a couple cards, I'll figure out what list you should add to. And as I see information that might be interesting to you, I share. Um, so I would say the, the number one thing that I think in terms of both career paths, and I'd like for you all maybe to talk a little bit more about your careers at larger institutions, um, as well as creating uh, social capital, networking and connecting, is to follow through. A lot of people will be given a card or will be introduced to somebody and either because time sucks us up and we're all so busy or because we get shy, like, okay, now I've got his card, what do I possibly say? Mm -hmm. um, to actually do the follow, the follow through is what really makes people move forward um, and being willing to read people's resumes, read people's cover letters, read people's grant applications, and just share because a lot of times people, when I was younger, I probably would have done more quicker if somebody had just told me, well, this is sort of the right way you approach this. And a lot of times I didn't know and I had to really look from a distance to say, oh, I admire Myron. So I'm too shy to ask Myron if she would talk to me, but maybe I'll just sort of look and see how I can learn a lot of what she does. So I'm, I'm really curious about uh, career paths and what you would say your career paths have been and how you find information. And my final comment was that I think that having the jobs list that, that Nat puts out has been very uh, you know, important to know that there's at least one place you can look where there are all these different people feeding opportunities to it. Thanks. That's great advice. I'll just, I just want to echo that. I, um, uh, just following through is so important, but also recognizing like who you meet today, don't dismiss, like don't, we live so day to day that we don't realize like, you might know this, you might see this person six years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And the number of times where I met somebody years ago and then it was like a coffee, never met again. And then like 10 years, 20, 10 years later, it's like my colleague or something. I don't know, it's just, you can't predict that, predict who's in your life. And it's just a quick story of, Cory Booker did a commencement at, uh, and he was just telling the story of how there was a crying baby and the mother had, was embarrassed and he was just a kind person to this mother and this baby and then like 15, 20 years later when he was running for XYZ, you know, he gets a letter from the mother with a donation and then the son or daughter like volunteered on his campaign. Like those simple acts are just so, you know, you can't measure them. Uh, just my career path is uh, your typical millennial story. Um, you know, uh, I, but my point being I jumped around a lot um, intentionally, and there's been studies saying that jumping around earlier in your career is important to understand what you appreciate and what not. So I come from sort of a startup world, uh, mass a uh, couple business accelerators, uh, two years at a national policy organization, two years at another startup, um, and that all that sort of different cross-sector experience of business, nonprofits, and government uh, wasn't intentional, um, but has given me a lot of sort of the perspective of how I lead my work, and not just you know assuming my day-to-day -day responsibilities, but the empathy, whether it's nonprofits or you know philanthropy, or et cetera, because I got to work in that day-to-day, -day, it's I guess uh, built up my authenticity. Um, so the other part, I just sort of what shaped my career is I never really think ahead of my career. I just try to do good work, and a lot of times in our careers, we think about the next thing, 
but the best way in my perspective of networking or advancing your career is just like do your job great right now and then doors open up because every opportunity that's been presented to me has been because uh, at least people, I trick people into thinking that I've been doing good work. So, um, so at least pretend to do good work and see where it happens. But uh, that would be by autobiography or memoir, I guess. Well, mine is a great juxtaposition yeah. because I started at John Hancock straight out of college, Beautiful. and I was there for yeah. 12 years. Yeah, you're loyal. Yeah. So I <laughs> did not uh, shop around, yeah. and I, I had many opportunities within that time. It was important to me if I did re if I remain there um, to have a new role or at least some upward mobility every two years. I had, um, even if I, you know, the next job I had been doing that role for three years before I got the title, I some, some new project or something. So there, there is a way to stay at an organization for a good amount of time and make sure, sure your skill set continues to evolve and you don't get stale. I started out as a stock analyst and then the Great Recession happened and that pushed me serendipitously into mm -hmm. corporate philanthropy and that's when uh, I was able to embrace really complex challenges like workforce development and mm -hmm. uh, poverty alleviation and um, how to be a good strategic supporter um, an empathetic funder. So that was my career trajectory until ending business school. I wanted to spend more time in strategy and that's what I'm doing now. And on the side, I have one client that I work with who um, I'm helping as a thought partner for their philanthropic work. So I'm able to continue to uh, use that muscle. I just wanna just echo what Yasmin said. I um, somehow I got to become a, the token millennial in a lot of conversations and people ask me for my advice, like how do I manage millennials, et cetera. And um, because we're both like the most narcissistic but also the most compassionate generation ever. So it's like, you know. Um, but the one thing that I think is consistently true is what Yasmin said is that it, even working at a company, it's not about work. Sometimes it's good to work for like a social impact driven organization. People think like, oh, you millennials want to do social impact every day. Um, but it's more about personal professional growth. Um, and that happens in the two, three year sprint usually. Uh, so if you, it's not the, it's not that millennials wanna jump around from job to job to job, it's that they wanna be perpetually challenged. Right. Uh, so from a manager perspective, it's like, okay, two years, probably getting a little, you probably master that skill set. what can we do next? And if you can't change it up in that thing, maybe it's best for that person to leave and you should be proud, right? Um, so that's honestly of all like the millennial trends, generalizations, et cetera, that I would say is probably in my opinion, the truest. Well, I, I agree with what Justin said that you do the best job you can wherever you are doing that job. I think that's just good um, work sense, you know. Um, I'm not gonna give the number of years that I've been at anything because then I start giving away my age and I'm not, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I'm not gonna do that today. Um, but I, you know, I knew I was going to be a performer, I'm a musician, but I also knew I wanted to be an educator, and so I've moved between those two roles my entire career path. Um, started my teaching career um, in Chicago, um, in the public schools, moved to the university, Northeastern Illinois University, to do teacher training of, you know, um, music teachers. Um, when we moved to Boston, um, from Chicago, I landed in that space of arts administration just by, you know, a phone call. And so that's the space where, at that point, there was not this degree for arts administration. There was not this roadmap for arts administration. We made it up as we went along. We planted those stakes and we created those jobs. Um, but still in that, very much always educating always you know, um, in that administrative space and, and moving into the Boston Public Schools, again, having the opportunity to be both that educator and that administrator. Um, so I'm not sure if that was a planned career path, um, but I always knew that my goal was to take what I loved, my passion, you know, and my passion was music education, music, arts education in general, but to take that passion and make it what I did every day. And so I've been fortunate enough to do that um, and I think along the way I have impacted, you know, lives, I have impacted, you know, opportunities, and I have hopefully been a mentor 
um, and have you know thought you know um, more about how do I then um, leave that legacy and that legacy being that there are people who come behind me who can continue the work and who feel like that whatever step I gave them you know it was a step that was pretty solid and they could you know could Myron, stand on. I don't think you have to hope so I actually <laughs> knew of Myron before I met her in person because I know one of her mentees and when we would talk about what would be next in her career she would talk about her conversations with Myron mm. Parker Brack and it wasn't until you know being in a meeting somewhere and you walked into the room and so you definitely are a mentor so thank you you don't have to hope on I that. just met her 20 minutes an hour ago she's my mentor too <laughs> <laughs> well that makes yeah. me feel good yeah so we are at time so um, any last comments to our audience about how we keep this conversation going besides passing out cards and giving them to Kendall I'll, you know, honest, first I just want to say thank you to, to Catherine and Arts Boss and ICA and Vicky and um, you know, I generally mean that you know, the success of this region needs to include the arts and culture creativity perspective. So if there's something that we could partner on from, a, from the lens of the business community, uh, I'm very open to it. Um, it's not as going to happen the night and day, but we need to push our business leaders to, to respect the arts and culture as a, a mandatory versus like a nice to have. So. Um, I have business cards, et cetera, and uh, very much look forward to continue that conversation. Yeah, and thank you for having me here uh, this evening. I really believe in what we're doing, which is support this sector, you know, you know, from the ground up and from the top down and from the, you know, outside in. So continue to engage folks who are you know, outside of the sector, continue to engage the leaders and put pressure on them, continue to support you know, the grassroots organizations who are doing you know, the front line, very tough work. So that's my advice. Well, thank you for joining us this evening. Yep. <laughs> thank you so much. Can you hear me? Thank you so much, everyone. We really do appreciate you being here this evening. And again, thank you, thank you, thank you to Marion Par Parker Brass, to Justin Kang, and to Yasmin Cruz uh, for just being kind enough to be here and to talk about your experiences and to share with us this evening. So we are really appreciative of that. Thank you again. Uh, let's give a round, one more round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I do want to thank all of you for coming out this evening and for the really great insights that you shared yourselves and maybe a couple of things that I'd like to leave you all with and maybe challenge you all as well. Um, like Justin is currently in a challenge to do one new creative arts experience every month. Uh, maybe something that we can do either individually or collectively with, with our peers, with people that we work with, is to challenge them to have an arts experience in a space that they're not used to going into. Mm. Right? Um, we need to cross the rivers, or the one river that we have. <laughs> right? You know? The river. Well, that's true. <laughs> we can cross <laughs> the mystic too. Um, but we do, as a community, um, need to be really sort of inclusive of not just our neighborhoods, but other neighborhoods that we don't typically find ourselves in. Um, and we really do need to be mindful of why we don't find ourselves in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. and what our perceptions are of those neighborhoods, um, which are often very wrong, mm -hmm. right? And so I challenge you all to think about, you know, going not just the Arts of Boston calendar uh, to see what's happening, what's out there, um, but really just taking that initiative to get all that information, to get on all those mailing lists, uh, to read magazines that you don't typically read, um, and to just be well informed, because the more informed we are, the better off we are as a society, and hopefully the more inclusive we can be as well. That being said, I do want to mention one thing, and one of the reasons, again, why we have been having these conversations around leaders, uh, leaders of color in the arts, leaders of color who are allies, who are really doing this work, is because the narrative that there aren't enough qualified leaders of color mm -hmm. or enough qualified arts administrators of color is still a narrative that, that exists in Boston and certainly not just in Boston um, with some of our other peers who are in other cities that have networks like this. 
And we've been thinking long and hard about how do we obviously change that narrative by certainly having these spaces and these conversations, um, but by also you know, putting together programming that we think can be in support of young leaders, of emerging leaders and mid-level career leaders as well. And so one of the things that I've been working on this past year is to really think about how we can formalize this um, path and how we can be sort of create a mentorship and sponsorship program. Now, there's research that's out there that says that women and people of color are, un they are over mentored and yet they are under sponsored. And there is a really big difference between a sponsor and a mentor, both of which are very valuable um, you know, experiences and people to have in your corner, but a sponsor really is someone who is going to be willing to put that seat for you at the table, who is really going to make sure and to look at your career track, where you want to go, the community you want to serve, and make sure to open those doors for you. And so we are in development right now, um, putting together a sponsorship and mentorship program that we do hope that we will be able to launch in a couple of months. So we're gonna take the summer to really figure it out and find some good funding for it because that's also very important. Um, and beyond that, I do also want to shout out to your point about you know, the arts as a really strong economic driver, which is very, very true even here in Boston. So in 2014, Arts Boston put out a report called The Arts Factor uh, that showed the economic impact of the arts in Boston. You can fill, of the arts experiences that people do in one year in Boston, you can fill um, Fenway Park over 488 times. So we are out there and we are doing great work um, and the city of Boston itself has the highest number of arts organizations per capita than any other metro city in this country. So we're out there. Um, and that's information that we've been sharing and information that people hear, and we're really happy to be able to actually update the report uh, this year to be able to have that available. So when that comes out, I expect that all of you are gonna share it. Um, because again, we need to make sure that, that our various communities and cross sectors are aware of the impact of the arts, not just um, as the arts being a luxury, but also really being a power player in the economic community here. Finally, I'd like to invite you all downstairs into the former cafe area, which I know is called something else now. Common. The common room. Um, we have a, a little bit of nosh down there for all of you, and our lovely uh, panelists and moderator will also be down there as well if you have some follow-up questions. Um, and if you didn't get your beverage ticket, please let us know because I want to make sure that you did get that as well. So thank you all for coming out this evening, and we appreciate your time. <laughs>